Hello fellow problem solvers. So today we're going to be doing a problem from the Elmo 2019, problem number one. I suggest you try this nice problem out for a minimum of 10 minutes, ideally an hour to 45 minutes, not more than two and a half hours. If you'd like to go along with us, give it a go for the next 10 minutes. Put your first ideas out on paper. And without further ado, let's begin. So what do we have? We have a polynomial here with integer coefficients, okay. P of zero is one, okay, so the last coefficient is one. And we have a sequence defined with x zero is zero, and x of i plus one is p of x, okay? And we must show that there exists, for every i, that there exists infinitely many n, such that the GCD of x n and n plus c is one. Okay, so let's now work with this problem. What is the first sort of idea that you see? So infinitely many n exist. Let's assume there's finitely many. So for every n that's greater than n, we will have that, and this capital N, we will have that the GCD of xn and of n plus c is going to be greater than one. Let's assume this. So now what can we take? Well, one thing for me immediately is like looking at it backwards is let me take a prime. I can set this to be anything, right? This is just, you know, plus C. For some reason, this is important. We don't know why just yet, but I have, I'll set this to a prime P and I'll have the, the GCD of XN and actually uh, instead of XN of X of P minus C and P is equal to one. In other words, I'll have P divides X of P minus C. Actually, the GCD here is not equal to one, so it means it's equal to P. P divides X of P minus C. And furthermore, P divides X of P to the power of K minus C. Now, with this, this is just going at it backwards. Like, what am I going to be using? I'm going to be using primes because I know what that, that really narrows down what the GCD can be and it gives me some divisibilities. Maybe I can work with this and see how I can work with this and whether or not I can. I need to look at the definition here, right? I'll have two numbers which are congruent to Xi and Xj which are congruent modulo P. What does this give me with regards to that? So if xi and xj, congruent modulo p, does that tell me anything about the previous number? We don't know. Let's see what this tells us. So xi plus one, so xi plus one is equal to p of xi. So the first thing for me here is I know that there's a rule, this minus this, like the a minus b divides p of a minus p of b is a rule that's generally used in polynomials. So let me see if I can get anything from this equation here. It's going to be equal to p of xi plus 1 minus p of xi. Now, what do we know? We know, sure, this thing is equal to p of this. But we know that this thing right here is i plus 1 actually i plus 2, and this is x of i plus 1. So now I have that the differences of two consecutive numbers here in the sequence, I'll have x n plus 1 minus x n divides x n plus 2 minus x n plus 1. So now, does this tell us anything about what this prime factor maybe is, right? Does it tell us anything about x of p minus c is going to be divisible by p, so is this. So here's where I invite you to pause for the next 10, 20 minutes and try to push the problem forward. See what else you have. And here's the next step. And here's the thing. This a minus b divides p of a minus p of b. Sure, we, are, we can apply it to consecutive ones, but we can apply it to any ones, really, any, con any two of these. And now, for example, here, we know that this sum, x of p minus c, and x of, say, p squared minus c. 
Say actually, let's do a general thing first. So if p divides x to the n, xn, and p divides xm, say xm plus n. Then from here I know I'll have p divides x to the, what's it called out? If I have p divides m plus n minus xn. And then I'll have p divide, then I have this divides the p of this minus p of this, which is going to be x m plus n plus 1 minus x m plus 1. And then I'll be able to go on with this and I'll reach the number x m plus, what do I need to do? It's going to be plus 1. I want to get this to m, so I'll have m plus m minus x n plus m is also divisible by this, and it's divisible by p. I'll have, if xm is congruent to xm plus n, then this is also congruent to, actually, have I messed up here? m plus m. If this is congruent to modulo p, then this is also congruent to x, then xn plus m is congruent to x2m. If I'm not mistaken, actually this feels wrong, to actually m plus, to m plus n. So if there's, starting from 1, if xn is congruent to xn plus m, then every mth will be congruent to the same thing modulo this prime p. And furthermore, it seems like every single one of these will be congruent to the same thing modulo p. It will have to be divisible by p. Right, so this is starting from one of these. Now the question is, can it go backwards? Right, because it says starting from xn, this is congruent to, what's it called? If these two are congruent modulo p, then the next one is also congruent modulo p. But what about xm? If it's not congruent to xn modulo p, if it's not divisible by p, then if I have this is congruent to, if this is not congruent to xn, I'll have xm, say m is less than n, it doesn't matter really, but xn minus xm will divide xn plus 1 minus xm plus 1, will divide all the way till xn plus, say, what are we doing here? n is greater than m. So I want to get m to n, so n minus m, and minus x n divides this. So these two, this is going to be congruent the same thing as this modulo p. Though, can we move this backwards in any way, shape, or form is my question now, right? Can I, if this is divisible by p, I know this is divisible by p, I'm not sure if this is, but it doesn't tell me anything backwards just now. Can I use anything, the fact about them being polynomials to go backwards? And here's where I invite you to take another five, 10 minutes and try to pause and work with the problem. And here's the next step. So now we figured out, once we have this, we can say, starting from n, the modulos of xn, modulo p, are periodic. Right, so that's what we know starting from n, when this happens. Now, and, and this is something that we will have for, you know, if this isn't true, for infinitely many n, we will have this for primes big enough. And for n is equal to p minus c and n plus m is equal to p squared minus c. So now from here, can we go backwards is the question. We know starting from here, we have a period. Can we prove that we have a period before that modulo p? Given how this is set up, it seems like we should be able to, like we're applying, like what's special about pn of zero? Like we should be, we should try to see if we can do it in any way, shape or form. And so let's, let's look at this, this number, x of m on n, x of m of n is p of n, and that's applied to p of n of zero. This is divisible by p. 
Now, this thing inside is also divisible by P. And when we're looking at this modulo P, we have this thing is going to give us a zero modulo P. And then we're applying P M times to something zero modulo P. So if we look at the modulo P, if we look at a modulo P, we can get we can get a much nicer we can have a much nicer way for which we prove that this is zero. And how can we actually like formally prove this? Well, we can say if if say some x is congruent to y modulo m, then we know that p of x is going to be congruent to p of y modulo m for any polynomial p. And furthermore, this tells us that what we have inside, this whole, the whole thing being x, this being x, this being that p this, as a big polynomial, because this is congruent to 0 modulo p, x is congruent to 0 modulo p, if this is congruent to p of m, applied 0 to 0 modulo p, because this also generalizes to p of m, p applied m times to x, and p applied m times to y. And so now we have that this 0 is congruent to p m of 0 modulo p, which is to say that we can go forward, that we can go backwards as well. So now what do we have? We have, assuming the contrary, we have p, x of p minus c, is divisible by p, and we have p is also dividing x of p squared minus c. And now we can keep going backwards, subtracting this once, subtracting it again and again and again. And how many times can we subtract it? Well, if I multiply everything through by p first, I will get, I'll get p squared minus pc times, I'll subtract here. So p squared minus pc, have p squared minus c minus this is going to give me these cancel out. I'll have this as pc minus c. I'll have x pc minus c is divisible by p. And now I multiply this by c. So I'll subtract again c times. So I'll, I'll subtract pc minus c minus c times p minus c. And it's going to leave me with c squared minus c. So I'll have p divides x of p squared, x of c squared minus c. So p divides x of c squared minus c. And we have done this by choosing an arbitrary prime, really, just have such that p minus c is greater than this n. And if we choose such a prime, then we have this. Since c here is not equal to 1, this thing right here is a constant. Now the question is, can this constant is going to be divisible by many primes? Pause for 10 minutes and try to push the problem further. And here's the next step. So now, what does this tell us? P divides c squared minus c for infinitely many primes p, mind you. Well, given this thing is a number, right? It's a constant term. That means that this term has to be equal to zero. Now, what does this tell us? Is this a contradiction? No. A polynomial can be periodic. We haven't sh actually, we haven't shown that it can't be periodic, to be precise. So this polynomial is now periodic with a period of c squared minus c, which means that xn is actually equal to xn modulo c squared minus c. Right. Or xn is equal to xn that it, xn minus c squared plus c. So now with this, what do we do? Right? What do we do here? We've shown this is the case. x0 is this. So now we have, let's see, when we plug in, this is going to give us x of c squared minus c times k is going to be 0. 
Okay, that GCD will not be 1. So we don't really have that, but we have P of 0 is 1. So we have x1 is equal to 1, and then x1 plus k times c squared minus c is also going to equal 1. And now with this, what do we have here? What does this become? Well, actually, I, can I would invite you to pause for two to three minutes and try to figure that out. Because this thing right here now becomes, so for n is equal to this thing right here, we have the GCD of 1 and something, <laughs> and something else that is, um, that it doesn't matter what it is, because the GCD of this k of c squared minus c plus 1. The GCD of these two numbers is going to equal 1 because you have a 1 here. And we can set a k that's high enough because this thing right here isn't 0. Right? c is greater than 1, so this isn't 0. We can set k incredibly high. This is positive, actually, furthermore. We can set k to be incredibly high. And by doing so, we are going, we're showing that we will have a pair, an xn, such that the GC of these two numbers is actually equal to 1, which is a contradiction we assumed only finitely many exist. It's led us to, hey, actually, I've constructed one that exists, and it's bigger than this n we've chosen. This finishes up the problem. It says, well, this has led us to a contradiction. I've actually found one. I said, I assume there's no, not a single one. And then that assumption has led me to, oh, wait, there actually is one. And now we're done. This finishes up our nice problem. The Elmo is cool. I'm going to say it again. I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. The Elmo is cool. These are cool problems. I like them. And as always, thanks for problem solving.